Okay, so welcome back. This is going to be screencast number two for chapter 27, and we are going to continue our discussion on birds. Now, what we're going to start off the screencast with is the idea that these animals have a huge variety of feeding habits. And so we're going to look at feeding and how these birds actually digest their food. Now, a lot of times what you can do is you can look at this group and you can identify actually what they feed on by making observations of the beaks. And so we have a huge variety of different type of feeding habits, from seed eaters to insect eaters and various others. Now, the amount of food that these animals actually have to consume can be pretty high. And a reason for that is because most birds have a very high metabolic rate. In other words, they need to take in a lot of food to actually maintain themselves. So small birds need even more food per body mass than you would find with the larger birds. Now, hummingbirds, for example, are going to use oxygen 12 times faster than a pigeon, primarily because of the way that they conduct themselves in their environment. They can eat up to 100% of body weight each day. And if you compare that to chickens, they only eat about 3.4% of their body weight each day. Now, birds in most cases are going to have a very rapid and efficient digestive system, again, because they have a very high metabolic rate. Um, a shrike, for example, can digest a mouse in under three hours, and a thrush will actually pass berries through their digestive tract in as little as 30 minutes. Now, as I had said before, the beaks can tell you a lot as to what type of food these animals actually consume. Now, over here on the right, you can see a large variety of beaks. And if you notice, in each one of these pictures, it kind of gives you an idea as to what these animals feed on. For example, if you look at this bird right here, it has a rather narrow kind of pointed beak. That beak is going to be specialized for eating insects. If you look down here towards um, kind of the middle of the diagram, you're going to notice it says surface skimming. So it's probably going to pick up maybe detritus, debris, maybe some small insects using sort of a scooping type of mechanism to sort of skim the surface of the water. Now in this case you have a flamingo that has a beak that is somewhat turned downward and of course it's going to be specialized to filter feed through the water. Now down here towards the bottom you notice we have a raptorial type of bird and if it's a raptor their beaks tend to be very massive and they tend to be curved towards the end and it's primarily because they're going to be specialized to rip their prey apart so they're going to be carnivores so they're going to need a very specialized beak to make sure that they can tear apart their prey. As we had said when it comes down to feeding their digestive system has to be a little bit different because their metabolic rate is so incredibly high so in most cases as you guys saw when you dissected into your pigeon and that esophagus is going to extend from the pharynx to the stomach and some may actually have a structure called a crop and that's going to serve to store food at the lower end of the esophagus. So when you guys dissected into your pigeons you probably got a really good look at that pouch or that crop-like structure and some of you may have even seen some seeds that were still found in that crop. Now the stomach is going to consist of two parts. It's going to consist of the proventriculus and the gizzard. And the proventriculus is going to be this area right through here and the gizzard is going to follow right after that. And the primary function of these two structures is for the proventriculus is to secrete gastric juice to help um, in digestion and the gizzard itself is going to help to sort of grind up the food again kind of depending on the type of bird that we're looking at. Now if it's a pigeon for example some birds may actually swallow pebbles or grit and that's going to assist in the grinding of that food within that gizzard. Now birds of prey are a little bit different you know such as owls and um, hawks maybe some kites etc these are going to form actually a specialized structure called a pellet. Now this pellet is going to be basically indigestible material in the proventriculus and because it's indigestible they need to have some way to eject it. So normally that pellet is going to be passed right back up through the digestive tract and it's going to sort of be coughed up by that bird. Sometimes in some science classes you will actually dissect through something called an owl pellet. And because owls, just like hawks and you know other types of um, prey type birds, they're going to have that pellet that's going to contain things like the fur, the bones, the things that just aren't digestible by that bird. Now most birds will have the cica, which is going to serve as fermentation chambers. And I believe when you dissect it into your um, pigeons, you had saw the cica that were on each side of that digestive tract. They kind of look like very tiny white beans. And then of course the cloaca is going to be the terminating point um, for that digestive tract along with the terminating point for the um, genital tract as well. In other words, that's where you're going to find the sperm leave the animal as well as the eggs that are going to leave the animal if that animal happens to be female. Now the circulatory system of these animals is um, somewhat similar to what you would find in mammals. 
they do have a four chambered heart and if you noticed in your pigeon it was a very large heart and they have very strong ventricular walls. Now that's going to be extremely important because you're talking about an animal that's going to expend a lot of energy when it comes down to flight and it's really important that we be able to pass that oxygenated blood to various parts of the body. Now this is going to demonstrate a complete separation of the respiratory and the systemic circulations. And so what we're looking at here is something that was somewhat similar to the reptiles where you had some chambers that were kind of partially separated, but now it's a complete four-chambered heart with complete separation of that oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. Now they're going to have brachial and pectoral arteries and these are going to travel actually to the wings and the breast of these animals because as we said before these animals do fly and so they expend a lot of energy when it comes down to that type of action and these are the main parts of the animal that will be involved in flight. Now the heartbeat is going to be relatively fast compared to mammals and it's going to be somewhat inversely proportional to size. So what that means is simply this, the smaller the bird the faster the heartbeat. Now the respiratory system of these animals of course are going to consist of lungs. Um, they do have air sacs which are going to extend through the thorax, the abdomen, and the long bones of the animal. Now, that doesn't mean that these are actually lungs but they do help to um, sort of cool the bird during vigorous exercise and maybe provide some buoyancy to your more aquatic birds. Now a large portion of the air is going to bypass the lung and actually flow directly to those air sacs as the animal actually takes in the air, which is inspiration. Now on expiration, the oxygenated air is going to flow through the lungs in a continuous airflow pattern. Now it's going to take actually two respiratory cycles for a single breath of air to pass through the entire system. Now, as we had said, it takes two respiratory cycles for a single breath of air to pass through the system. And so over here on the left hand side, you can see a representation of that respiratory system. Um, in the pigeon, for example, you probably got a good look at the trachea. And if you notice as that trachea travels down, you're going to see the lung. But if you notice, we have those various air sacs that we had talked about up towards the top of the screen. And they're going to be positioned through various points throughout that animal, both anterior and posterior. Now over here on the right, you're going to see those two cycles that we mentioned right up here. In other words, we're going to have the taking in of the air and the release of the air. Now if you notice, as the air passes through the trachea, right here, you can see this is the trachea. As that air passes in, it's actually going to make its way to the posterior air sacs, which are these air sacs that you see right down here. Um, a little bit of air actually might almost make it into the lung, but if you notice on expiration, in other words, what we would consider the release of the air from those air sacs, now the air is going to be pushed into the actual lung itself. Now down here for the second cycle of air travel, you're going to notice the air in the lungs now has actually been pushed into the, what we consider the anterior air sacs. And then on expiration, which is the actual release of the air from the animal, it's going to be pushed now out of the animal. In other words, it's going to come from those anterior air sacs and travel out. Now the excretory system of these animals are pretty simple. They have a large um, pair of metanephric kidneys, which is what you had seen in the um, reptiles. Urine flow through the ureters to the cloaca is going to be in the form of the uric acid, again very similar to the reptiles, and a lot of the water is going to be absorbed there. Now, as we had seen in some of the reptiles, some marine birds will actually excrete larger salt loads due to a diet um, where they basically might take in some seawater. And of course, you can't continuously take in that seawater without becoming dehydrated, so there needs to be a way to actually get rid of that salt. And so some of these animals will have what we consider salt glands right about through here, kind of right above the eye. And so what's going to happen is basically this salt is going to run out of the nostrils of these birds. So it's going to be continuously dripping out of the bird itself. And so that's going to be a really efficient way for them to get rid of some of that salt, that extra salt that they have in their body. Now the nervous system and sensory systems of birds is definitely well developed. Um, the bird's brain has well developed cerebral hemispheres, the cerebellum, and the midbrain. So much, much more advanced than we had seen in the reptiles. And you can see that over here on the right hand side. The size of the cerebral hemisphere is directly related to the intelligence of the bird. So this area that you see right through here, the larger it is, the more um, intelligent the bird happens to be. Now the cerebellum, which is where the muscle um, position sense or that proprioception occurs, is basically where you find equilibrium. In other words, the ability of that um, bird to remain upright. And of course, visual cues are also assembled in this area as well. So the cerebellum would be located right through here. Now the optic bulges or the optic lobes are going to be found on each side of the membrane. You can see them represented right through here. Um, and basically they're associated with the visual apparatus of the animal and of course the eye is going to be somewhat similar to a mammal eye. 
but it's going to be a little bit larger. It kind of depends on the body size of the animal. And the one thing about the eyes in this group of animals is that they are considered immobile. In other words, they really can't look back and forth like we can. So since they're positioned on the sides of the animal's head, the animal actually has to turn its head from side to side to be able to see. So not really good peripheral vision. Birds of prey have eyes that have actually been directed a little bit more forward, and that basically allows them a little bit better depth perception. That's going to assist them when it comes down to locating prey. Now, the sense of smell is going to be very poorly developed, except in your flightless birds, um, maybe some of your ducks, and of course the vultures that are going to be more scavengers. So that sense of smell is going to be really important to that group. Now, bird ears do not hear as high of a frequency as do humans but they definitely do surpass us in their ability to distinguish the differences in pitch and intensities. And that's going to be really important when it comes down to communication with these animals, especially reproductive communication. Now, this group of animals will migrate, kind of similar to what you would see in the mammals that we're going to look at next. About half of all bird species will migrate to a certain extent. Most of them can move between southern wintering regions and northern summer breeding grounds. So they can exploit the seasonal changes. So what they're looking at here is they're looking at where they're going to find the most food and they're going to be able to avoid predators a lot of times in this respect as well. Migration is also going to expand living spaces for these animals and it's going to reduce the aggressive territorial behavior sometimes you will see in some groups of birds. Now migration will allow birds to avoid any climatic extremes and food shortages. Basically meaning that if food becomes scarce they can move on and find food elsewhere. Now the last thing we look at is the reproductive system of birds. Um, the testes do tend to be very small in these animals until they approach the breeding season. Um, if you notice some of the pigeons we had looked at, it was really hard to locate sometimes the testes in the animal. Um, they do actually enlarge to about 300 times their normal size when they are in breeding condition um, because again these animals do tend to be seasonal when it comes down to breeding. But before discharge, the sperm are going to be stored in a greatly enlarged seminal vesicle. The males of most species are going to lack the penis, which means that the mating is simply going to involve bringing the cloacal surfaces, in other words, that terminating point of the digestive and reproductive system, together. In other words, they have to be in contact with each other. In most birds, the left ovary and oviduct will develop, and the right ovary and oviduct will actually degenerate. And for those of you that had a female pigeon, you probably saw um, some white tubes right through the kind of pressed against the back of the bird on one side, but you notice they were absent on the other side because in most cases only the left will tend to develop and the right's going to go ahead and degenerate. Now when you think about the egg and how does it actually um, get produced, you're going to notice on the right hand side we kind of have a diagram representing how that egg is going to travel through the reproductive tract. So they're going to have an expanded end of that oviduct and so right through here is going to be the oviduct of the animal and this is going to be where the ovaries will be located and once you actually have a ruptured follicle which means re basically a release of that ovum it's going to start traveling through the oviduct. Now as it does that you're going to notice there's going to be some special glands that are going to add those different parts to the egg that we had talked about when we talked about our um, amniotes. In other words we had our amnio introduction way back at the beginning of chapter 26. Now there's going to be special glands that are going to add albumin or egg whites to the egg as it passes down the oviduct. As you get further down the oviduct, the shell membranes, the shell, and the shell pigments are also going to be secreted. Again, this is going to be as that egg is traveling through this tube. Fertilization is going to take place in the upper oviduct before that albumin and shell are actually added. But the sperm itself can actually remain alive in the oviduct for many days after a single mating. And this is really important because normally most birds will only lay one egg every day or maybe one egg every two days. So as it is produced, as it's kind of released from this ovary, it's important the sperm be available to fertilize that ovum. Now mating systems of birds, in this case over 90% of bird species are actually monogamous, which means that um, basically they only mate with one partner each breeding season. So this is not necessarily for life, but it is considered monogamous. Um, there are a few species such as swans, geese, um, and then even some of your parrots actually which will actually choose a partner for life. In monogamous birds both the male and females are equally adept at most aspects of parental care. So what that means is normally they're both going to take an equal part in caring for the offspring. Now in regards to bird territories the male will often sing to announce his presence to females and definitely to drive away other males. Um, females will basically just kind of wander about and they will select a male that offers the best chance of reproductive success. 
And a lot of times that will be based on the way the male actually looks in regards to his color pattern, and sometimes by the way that male actually sings. In other words, if you have a male that actually sings better than another male, maybe a certain pattern, maybe the um, intensity of the song, then the female is most likely to choose that male over another. Now usually a male can defend an area that provides just enough resources for one nesting female. And so the male would be very careful in picking out the best place for reproducing. Now, once the eggs have been laid, normally they're going to be incubated by either one or both parents. They have to be kept warm for a certain period of time. Most songbirds will require about maybe 14 days for hatching. Then those of ducks and geese can basically require anywhere from about 21 days to 28 days for those eggs to hatch. Now often the female will perform most of the duties of incubation, but as we had said before, depending on the species of bird, they can share in those duties as well. Now we have two groups of offspring. We have what we consider precocial birds, and these are the ones that are actually able to feed and run or swim as soon as they are hatched, and you can see that over here on the right hand side with this duck. So once that egg hatches, this is what you get, and so they're very self-sufficient. Um, they do still have some care that's given by the parents, but a lot of what they would need can be taken care of by themselves. But then you have what we consider altricial birds. These are the ones that are naked and helpless at birth, and they have to be fed in the nest for at least a week, if not longer. And over here on the right, you can see a good example of what we consider an altricial type of offspring. Okay, so that's going to finish up chapter 27. As always, it's really important that you make sure you complete your screencast study guide before you come to class.